Well, today our message today is being the head and not the tail. Amen. Being the head and not the tail. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 13. If you're taking notes, if you need a pen, I have pens. If you're taking notes, please make sure um, that you do. Uh, I've got the sheets there, your song sheets. You can actually write on the back of those. You can take those home. Bless the Lord. Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. I read from the New International Version. It says here, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. Amen. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord that I give you this day and carefully bring, follow them, excuse me, you will be the top and never the bottom. Let me read that one more time. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail if you pay attention to the commandments of the Lord. Amen. Now, before we get into being the head and not the tail, let's talk about somebody who is great, who is greater, and who is a blessing in our life. Let's talk about God. Who is God to us today? Everything. Does everyone, Lord Jesus say everything? Mm -hmm. can, we, can we say everything? Yeah, everything? Don't get me stirred up this morning. Oh, yeah. I will not be before y'all. As I say every Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> God is the all-powerful one. He is all-powerful. Every situation you have, everything that can happen above and below, God is in control of it. One thing I think the first time I stood before y'all at this uh, service, one of the things I talked about is, is the bigness of the universe. It takes light from one end of the universe to the other. Millions of years to get to us because that's how big the universe is. And you know what he just holds in his hands. Woo. He made all things. He made the world. He keeps the world. And he also made us. Amen. Who in here is fearfully and wonderfully made? Amen. Mm -hmm. Jesus. He is the greatest, the biggest, and the vastest. God is love. He is good. He is perfect. God is worthy of all praise, and he is enthroned in heaven. We can think of a whole lot of more things to say about God. We can talk about that time when we were sick, and he raised us up. We can talk about that time where we were going through, and he brought us out. We can talk about that time that he paid our bills. We can talk about that time when he raised one of our family members up. Amen. We can talk about that time when open arms put out advertisement in the magazine. We got to read. And ain't nobody come. And we have no building. But the Lord is faithful. Amen. Woo! Making up today. But then after we say all these things, he says something that is peculiar. A very, very peculiar thing. I'm going to read this here with Genesis Chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make God in our own likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the wild stock, wild stock, excuse me, livestock, and all the wild animals and all creatures that move along the ground. But let me, let me go to the first part again. Let us make mankind in our own image. We talked about all those great things about God, but wait a second, he said that he made us in his image. Hmm. So if he made us in his image, why? What does the Bible say? Why are we so downtrodden, oh my soul? Hmm. Why? My why do we accept the position as the tail and not the head? After we said all of these great things about God, he created us in his image. Why are we in a mess 
of our minds and our spirits sometimes. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for your power, your anointing. I thank you that you have blessed us so much to be here and that you have already proclaimed this word, that we are the head and not the tail. Now, we have talked before about the rightful position that we should be in Christ. But now we're going to talk just a little bit about claiming that rightful position. Who are we in God? And what does it mean? Number one, we are God's beloved children. Remember that. We are God's beloved children. Now, I was actually reading um, a news, I was reading a news article, and I actually posted on Facebook this morning about a kid who was actually disowned by his parents. Yes, 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 yes. And so we go out here, and it's so interesting how we do, because we just get the word all wrong. How do we disown our children when Jesus don't disown us? or disown anybody when God doesn't disown us. When we mess up. When we screw up. And then make it worse. God knows when we're going to screw up before we mess up. He knows what we're going to do. And like I said, we love this whole doctrine where God is always trying to strike somebody down. We get out here and you know, if God wanted to do that, he would have never made you born. But you know what? We have beloved children. We have access to the king. We don't need permission to come to God. I know in some traditions they have to go through a, a, a priest or an intermediary. It says we come boldly. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Boldly before the throne of grace. He's our father. We don't ask for permission. We don't go out there and say, hmm, well let me go and see if he's busy. We just go to the Father. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received a spirit that makes you slaves so that you live in fear of you. Let me stop right there. We reference God, but we don't have to live in fear of God. He is what? He's our Father. But listen to this. Rather, the spirit you have received brought you adoption to sonship. And we can cry, Abba Father. Abba Father, we hear these stuff all the time in church. Abba Father means dear Father. Dear Father. We've got a God who is our dear Father. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. Because you are his sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our heart so that we can cry out Abba Father. He sent the spirit into your heart. Mm, we're going to get that to the spirit in our heart. We'll get that in a second. Number two, we are in Christ. We are forgiven and not condemned. What does it say Romans 8? For there is no condemnation. It don't say a little bit. It don't say a little fraction. It says there is no condemnation. Hmm. Where does condemnation come from? It comes from us. We start, it comes from us. Like we start condemning ourselves. And then we go condemn everybody else. Hmm. Then, after we condemn everybody else, we go and we start a movement. We start a denomination in the church. So that we can condemn the other denomination. And so 2,000 years in the line, we've got a mess where we're all sitting around condemning each other. Woo, glory. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that who else, whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the earth to condemn the world, but the world may be saved. 
We are not victims. We are more than conquerors. If I could read this every day, because sometimes we like to let things conquer us. What are we conquering? What are we conquerors over? We are conquerors over circumstances. You take a note, write it down. We are conquerors over circumstances. There's an old saying um, that uh, I've heard, and I think it's so profound, that we are, <clears throat> life is 90%, or excuse me, 10% of what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. 10% how, what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. I used to work for, uh, you know, we used to work for, I used to work for Warren Buffett Company. And we always talk about it. Warren Buffett sees the like that Warren Buffett could go out there and take a penny in the parking lot and make a billion dollars off of it. We need to take the circumstances that we have and we need to be conquerors over them. Past abuse and issues. Who in here has ever had past abuse and issues? Has anybody? Oh, Lord. We're conquerors over those things. We look at those issues. What's that song? I said it last week. What is it? Uh, wipe me down, wash me off. What's, what's that? Wipe me down. Yeah, wipe me down. What the, amen. You just wipe it off. Those past issues. Because if we bring those issues into the future, we brought them in the future. Not God. We brought them in the future. Or God has made us conquerors over emotional trauma and issues. The Bible says, cast down all imaginations. What is an imagination? It's something that's made up. We are conquerors over money and money issues. Now, I want to say money and money issues. Because what will happen is that we don't have a money issue, but money has become under our control. So it is no longer something that uh, we are using as a tool. It's now something that we control. What's that uh, song uh, by, the, by the Reverend Sam Smith? Money on my mind? He said, money ain't on my mind. Love is on my mind. Amen. And money issues. Amen. God has made us victory over money and issues. God has made us conquerors over negativity, negative people, and opinions. God has made us conquerors over sin. Romans 6 says that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness. We do not have to live in bondage forever. Sometimes we have allowed things, and a lot of times, I think one of the biggest things also that is a big thing with sin is that so many times in churches we have been taught how to put it. We focus more on sin and not the one who heals sin. And so we run around and we've been busy focusing and pointing out sins and sins and sins. But the bottom line is this. God can conquer your sins and your bondages. Anger and past hurts. We need to be a conqueror of those. If we go out there and stay in our anger and past hurts, it's stuff that we didn't have on. Let it go. Amen. Ooh, Jesus. Jesus. Number four, we are wealthy in Christ Jesus. We are wealthy in Christ Jesus. We are wealthy in Christ Jesus. We have the Holy Ghost power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. For you have received what when the Holy Spirit comes upon you? Power. 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 We have received that power. We're not powerless. How many times have we walked around powerless? These are the things that we need to be claiming. These are the things that make us the head and not the tail. So what are the symptoms of us not knowing? How do we know whether we are the head or not the tail? 
or that they have claimed that hey, place. I put on here, these are the lacks. These are the symptoms that we, uh, that show that we do not know, we have not gotten to the place where we have accepted that we have not attained. Number one, lack of peace. It's where we go and we turn to the things of the world to give us peace. It's where we turn to everything over here and over there and every, everywhere to give us peace. Another thing, if we are not being, if we're being the tail of the head, is we like vision. How many of us know that God has a vision for our lives? Amen. Who in here has, let's, 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 let's make this work, who in here has ever been aimless? Come on! Been aimless. What does it say? Being swayed to and fro. I've been there before. Because I forgot who I was in Christ. We forget that sometimes. We need to be, we need to be working on a vision. If you don't know your vision, ask God for a vision. Ask God to lead you to where you need to be. Focus. Work on some goals. These are practical things. Work on some goals. Go home and get your little book out. Get your little, uh, little, little pig book. Where are some goals? Lack of passion. Who in here has ever been, who here has ever been in a place where they lack the passion for life? Well, you're just getting by. I, have, I know so many times we just get by. Right? God has not put us there to just get by. He has made us to be what in life? More than what? More than a conqueror. Yes. If we are living in lack, we lack love. We lack love for ourselves, and we lack love for others. If we don't, if we're walking in a place where we have not accepted the position that God has called us to, we walk in a lack of love. We have to look at that. A lack, here we go. Lack of a distinction in Christ. Let me put that in plain terms. When people see you, do they see a Christian? Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Do people see you as a Christian? Mm. That's a rhetorical question. Because every day, sometimes people ain't going to see something. People look at you and say, no way. Ooh, Chris is a hot mess. <laughs> you know, he's down there preaching to them folk. Lord, he a hot mess. <laughs> God died for us so that we can get out of our hot messes. That thing right there got out of our soul. We are a chosen people. You didn't just choose God. He chose you. Mm, you are a holy priesthood. Remember what I said earlier? We don't need an intermediary or somebody to come to God for us. We come because we are the priest. Glory to be to God. I sometimes said this before. We are all ministers. Glory be to God. But ask yourself, are you living a life? Who is it all? If we claim to be in him, John, 1 John chapter 2, if we claim to be in him, we must walk as Jesus walked. Oh, get me stirred up. Here's the other part here. If we are being the tail and not the head, we like positive self esteem. Sometimes we got to start taking the inventory and ask ourselves, what do we think of ourselves? Are we, do we look down, do we, when we look in the mirror, do we see something ugly? Do we look in the mirror and do we see something that is trash? Why do we think this way? Sometimes it's because people have told us that. Sometimes I've been told, especially sometimes in our community, oh, you're too big. You're too small. You're too thin. You're too dark. You're too light. You're too this, you're too that. And we take that and we internalize that. And next thing we know, we 
we sit there and just all oh, low self-esteem and people, people go out here. I was talking to some brothers the other day. They, they come out there and they're telling me, well, you know, I can't get this and I can't do this. Sure, you can't get this and can't do this because you don't believe that you deserve this. Mm -hmm. You don't believe that God has ordained this for you. So, yes, you ain't get nothing. <laughs> what keeps us from being the head of that? Deuteronomy 28, verse 13. I'm going to focus on one part of that verse here. It says that we pay attention to his commands. So it says God will make you the head and not the tail, but then it says, but if you pay attention to his commands. Now let me ask you real quick. Who in here has ever uh, rode on the airplane? Who in here has ever been to a doctor? Who in here has never rode a plane or ever been to a doctor? Amen. So let me tell you, let me ask you a quick question. Suppose you go in there to the doctor and you got a headache and something's going on with you. You're really sick. And the doctor tells you, well, we're going to do this. And you ask the doctor, well, wait a minute, that just don't sound right. And the doctor tells you, oh, well, that's okay because I haven't, I haven't caught up on my medical school stuff. I haven't did that in 10 years. Now, if you know anything about a the doctor, they have to go back and study every, every, I think it's every year, every two years, they have to go back and do a practical where they go and they have to get caught up on all of the new information that's out there. Otherwise, if they don't do that, they'll still be bleeding people and putting leeches on people to try to get demons out of them. That's what they used to do. They used to go out there and drown witches. You got sick over here. We know now that you need some penicillin. Back then it was, oh, well, let's drown a witch. Now, if you've ever been on a plane, there's one fun thing I like about the plane is that you'll, 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 you'll watch, and when you, when you see the plane come in, the first thing you do, the pilot will do is what he'll do is he'll look at the plane. He'll get out there on the tarmac and will walk around the plane. He walks around, he looks at it, he or she, he touches the plane. He points at stuff, he looks at stuff, and physically looks at it with his eyes. What if your pilot didn't go to school? What if your pilot, now, 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 planes get, you know, they take planes and, and, and get new ones and nicer ones and everything? You know, I remember when we went to Florida, one plane was old as dirt. <laughs> then we got the nice plane that had these nice little monitors that told you how high you were, how fast the thing was going. That thing was going 514 miles per hour, and outside was negative 41 degrees. That's what it said. I said, well, now suppose when you're up there at 38,000 feet, that pilot came on there and said, hey, player, I haven't been practicing. I've never flew this plane before. I haven't took it into class. I haven't done any of this stuff. I'm just trying, I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm just winging it. There are no parachutes on planes. <laughs> that would be your last day. <laughs> start praying. You start praying. You pray that what you must do, you pray, you better pray that you pass off the way in the ground. But that's how we do it in our spiritual lives. Where does our Bibles at? We go look for our Bibles. Are they in the window in our car? Are they so faded, happy, holy ghost apples? I'm not condemning them. And what more is our Bible up in the window? And is it so faded that it don't open when we try to use it? When was the last time we picked up our word? This is not a condemnation. This is an admonition, an encouragement. If we want to know how to be the hand and not the tail, we got to get the instructions. We got to start reading that word. And as we talk about every Tuesday, if you don't know how to read, if you're not good with the reading, the Bible will read itself to you. We live in 2015. The Bible will read. It'll read to you in the English voice. It has a woman who reads it to you. It has an American man. It has a British man who reads it to you. Get there and start reading the word. Get there and study it. Look at how many other things that we study that we don't study the word of God. Think about that. Suppose your pilot, instead of studying that plane, he goes out there and he pulls, he comes up and he says, Oh, I didn't feel like looking at the plane. 
Did you see this post on Facebook? Do you see this girl's edges? Do you see her weave? And he told you that? You, look, you ain't gonna make it that day. <laughs> Another thing that holds us back from being the head and not the tail, fear. Fear of the unknown. You may, it may be unknown to you, but it ain't known to to God. The Bible doesn't, the Bible says this, it, when he was talking to the Pharisees, all those to you, amen. When he was talking to the Pharisees, he did not say to the Pharisees that when Abraham was, he was, he says he is. God is in the future and the past at the same time. We need to get over the fear of the unknown. We need to get the fear of a failure. What does the Bible say? Even when we fail, we win. Fear of any, uh, one of the other things that holds us back from who we are in Christ is ignorance and misinformation. One example of this that I saw that was a prime example is a movie called 12 Years a Slave. And they have a scene in that movie where the slave master goes and takes his interpretation of the word and starts telling the slaves what they need to do and how they need to act. He didn't quote the verse in the Bible that says, Masters, treat your slaves as you want to be treated because you have a master in heaven. He started telling them about how much if you don't, if you don't work my field the right way, how much I'm going to beat you. It was the saddest thing in the world to watch that. Especially though that was a true story, but how many of us today have gotten some slave master, some proverbial slave master in our lives who has told us that we're less than, that we can't come to the house of God? Amen. That God is somebody who is mean and is there to strike you down. How lastly do we claim our place in Christ? The good part. Start spending time with the children of the king. I didn't say be arrogant, but remember that you're a child of a king. Don't be going there. Let me ask you this. Who's ever seen, what's that, uh, Prince, Prince, uh, Prince Charles, and what's the girl named Princess Kate? Yeah. So what happens if you see them? Well, let me give you an example that was kind of funny. Uh, LeBron James, that we call him King LeBron. But is he really a king? Yes. No. So what does he do? He goes over there and puts his arm around the queen or the princess. Did you see how crazy she looked at him when, she, when he did that? Because you don't touch royalty. Another one that, that was a big boo boo was that uh, 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 First Lady Obama, she went and uh, she was talking to the queen and she turned her back to the queen. When, when she walked around, she walked. And when you're talking to royalty, you don't turn your back to the, to the queen. Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> are we getting this? We are royalty. We got to stop letting all this little stuff bother us because we are royalty. Woo, this thing got me stirred up today. Come on. You think about that for a second.
Another way I would put it, take your lemons and make lemonade. Mm -hmm. And I want to say something, this, this is really, this is a really a blessing because my mom told me one thing that was really important I feel in my life. She pointed out, she said, the Lord spoke to her one day, she said, and, and the Lord said this, he said that the Bible calls out struggles, tests, and trials. Mm. If you're at school and you fail all your tests and you fail that grade, what happens? Okay. You do it over again. Sometimes we have been, what happened for 40 years, 40 years they walked around in the desert, 40 years in that circle because they were in a test and they kept failing. Have we ever, and I'm not, I'm not being, making light of this, but have we ever seen those people at school who when we see them, they are 14 years old and they're in the fifth grade and we wonder what happened because they keep failing their test. Glory be to God. Take those lemons and make lemonade. Stop failing the test. If you keep failing the test, you're going to have to keep taking it again. If you can't walk in love, he is going to bring enemy after enemy after enemy in your life. And it's going to put your enemy in your face. And it's going to keep your enemy there until you learn how to love. Amen. Number three, be a giver. Be a giver. How do you claim to be in Christ? You be a giver. Let me teach you a word called commonwealth. We live in the commonwealth of Virginia. Now, where does the old word commonwealth come from? It means common will. Of who? The queen. The queen, actually. Well, yeah, it's the people now. Amen. But back then it was what it was. It was the queen. <laughs> or actually the queen, the king, was King, uh, was king George. Now let me tell you something about, a, about commonwealth. We have to go and be a giver because you've got to understand that if, let me kind of explain this. If we are, when you live in the commonwealth, you and everything you have is the commonwealth of the king. So if you're poor, you represent that the king is poor. He can't take care of his subjects. So what we need to do as well, as the Bible says, we 